Do we have somebody praying? If you do, you got your mic on. Yes, I'll pray, Sister Ling. I was having problems with my computer. Oh, thank you. Let's pray. Our dear friend, Father in heaven, we thank you that we can be together again for this meeting that you've given us as a gift, a truth. And we thank you for every blessing that you're giving us. We know that this is preparation time and with our hearts and minds open to receive all that you have for us, we pray that you will guide our speaker, Elaine, Sister Elaine, and that we will be able to really contemplate this truth and how it applies to where we are in our time today and our, on the lines that you've given us. We have an awesome responsibility that you've chosen us for. And I pray that each of us will appreciate all that you're doing to bring us into oneness with you and to be able to be the people that can, can reach the world, the Nephilims and the Levites and those that are still in Adventism so I pray that you'll guide us by your Holy Spirit, and we thank you for this, and we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to quickly share one screen real fast and then switch over to the other just to give an idea of what... Um, I want, I'm hoping that we can all help with, if I can find it, it's not on here. Hang on one second. The one I want's not there, so hang on just a second. one more time and if not then we'll just go with oh here we are good okay can you see that yes okay okay so I only roughly without a whole lot of thought was trying to race this together I started it this morning and then everything got kind of crazy and um and then I tried to finish with the um, I tried to finish. You guys there? Somebody got somebody? With We're here, but we hear a lot of feedback. Yeah. An echo. 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 Or somebody got a mic on, I think. Okay. Better? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So I don't think I have everything right just yet on here. But like I said, I was just trying to put the way marks on there real quick that we that we needed, and I I know I, I may still need to fix it. We know we have Sunday law close probation second advent, and I wasn't sure if I had this lined up right for what I'm trying to do, at least for this. But there's three lines that I kind of wanted to work on, and um, and I'll give you. As we did the other night on Wednesday, we did a brief review um, of what we've gone through so far. We went through the history of Napoleon, um, his Egyptian expedition, um, his battle with uh, the King of the South, Egypt, and then um, his battle with Syria, the King of the North, comes at him like a whirlwind. We went into the Syrian War um, of 1831 to 1841 the Ottoman-Egyptian battle, the battle between the King of the North and the King of the South. Then we went through the, um, the role of Islam and the rise of Muhammad, 2020 Islam restrained. We went through the House of Saud and saw um, the beginning of uh, Wahhabism as well. We saw in the role of Islam 
um, after the death of Muhammad is when the Sunni Shia split happened. And then in the House of Saud, we saw right from the beginning, Wahhabism, the extreme puritanical religious side, um, rose up and they've been in a relationship um, throughout their history. Um, we looked at the making of ISIS as well tra and saw, traced that through and saw that um, though ISIS was the, the, the Islamic State was defeated, ISIS wasn't defeated. So they don't have territory in Iraq and Syria, but they are still, we saw that they've already named a leader. Um, they're naming the leader after. Let me find who that is again, real quick. Um, Lysenia, if you could uh, mute yourselves when you guys hook back on because there's feedback. Yeah, I got it again, I think. Um, so it, okay, so um, so we saw that they, within a week after the death of, death of el-Baghdadi, that they already um, named a leader. Uh, we went through that. We went through the, the um, history of Saddam Hussein and saw that in um, 1959, Saddam Hussein was already on the payroll of the CIA to, um, to assassinate the Iraqi leader that was um, Soviet communism friendly. And he had broken a, um, a pact that the Middle East was in that was to be a, a buffer state between um, the Middle East and the, the ones that were participating in it were the ones that were on the border of Russia there or the Soviet Union there. Um, and, and we saw that, that the leader of Iraq, the one that took over in Iraq, was, um, immediately jumped out of that pact and was very communist friendly and the US government wanted him assassinated. Um, so that was the beginning of the relationship of the United States with Saddam Hussein. And then we know that um, in the 80s that even Ronald Reagan um, played a role in, in uh, giving um, him the, need, the things he needed for chemical weapons as well. So when he used chemical weapons, nobody said anything about, uh, nobody, there was no outrage about the chemical weapons that were used. Um, and I think that's, roughly where we left off. So what I was trying to finish up is at least get the 1798 to the second advent, 1989 to the second advent, to show the two Syrian wars here, but also to include, which I do not have on here yet, um, I don't know how to draw this one out, but at least 1979 to 1989. Because in the period of 1979, we have the Iranian revolution, or sometimes called as also the Islamic revolution, um, and uh, then you had the Iran go from there to the Iran-Iraq war, um, but also at the same time, you had the Soviet-Afghan war going on. So that's another one, this 10 year period that I want to get in here. And I thought that if I finish this up and send it out, perhaps others can be um, thinking on these things too. Some might be led a little bit differently than I am to go beyond just the history um, to help us to start putting things on the line and showing, um, as we're, I know that Elder Tess is heading into Millerite history, to start really mapping the battles of the King of the North and the King of the South at each of these places, the win, wins, losses, and the characteristics and that such. So anyway, so that's um, what I kind of started here. And if there's time in, in when we're done going through the notes that we have, maybe we can come back to this, but definitely we'll save this and be working on it later. So any questions on that? No, but it's a really good idea. Okay, I thought so too. I, it's like, it helps me it's to just like what I would need for me to be able to remember and understand all this. This is like, for me, I would love to do that. Yeah, that's great. Okay, okay. Sounds good. Because um, we've looked at a lot of histories, but one that I'm finding that, um, I don't know, maybe it was, maybe it's my not knowing what I'm doing or just the way it was supposed to be. I don't know, working my way towards See, this is how naive I was, and I think I said it on Wednesday, but this is how naive I was about things. It's like I knew that you had the Afghan, Soviet-Afghan war, and you had the Iraq-Iran war, and I probably knew to some extent they were going on at the same time, but I really never connected it in thought. And so they're going on at the same time, and there's things that we, more things that we need out of the um, Soviet-Afghan war, I think, that, and that's the, the study that I'm working on after this one. And if anybody else wants to do it, they're welcome to it. I have part of it started. So um, otherwise I'll just keep going on with what I'm doing. 
But then we'll take each of these histories and start looking at them from the point of view of, of I think it's important to look at the Millerite history, which Josiah Litch, you know, put, um, there's two things we need, two, pers two is it perspectives, uh, or, or I don't know if perspective is the right word, that we need to be looking at this through. One is Josiah Litch um, and his application of France being the king, being the him, and the, the um, two Islamic ones being king of the north and the king of the south. Um, and, and then the perspective that we know that we've been studying for years, and that's Daniel 11, 40, part B, and that understanding. So we need to start sorting these things out and trying to figure out um, how to lay it out on a line. Okay, so that's what I had there. So the Iranian Revolution, um, let me get the slideshow on here. Um, January 78 to February 79. The Iranian Revolution, um, also known as the Islamic Revolution or the 1979 Revolution, was a series of events that culminated in the overthrow of the Pahlavi dynasty under Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, that's the Shah of Iran, who was supported by the United States. So the, so the Shah of Iran at that time is supported by the United States. And that all intertwines with the history of uh, um, Saddam Hussein too. So we'll kind of see that in these studies, these things overlap. Um, and the replacement of his government with an Islamic Republic under the Grand Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, a leader of one of the factions in the revolt. The revolution was supported by various Islamist and leftist organizations and student movements. Demonstrations against the Shah commenced in October 1977, developing into a campaign of civil resistance that included both secular and religious elements. The protests rapidly intensified in 1978 as a result of the burning of the wreck of Rex Cinema, which was seen as the main cause of the revolution. And between August and December that year, strikes and demonstrations paralyzed the country. The Shah left Iran in exile on the 16th of January, 1979, as the last Persian monarch, leaving his duties to a Regency Council and Shapur Bakhtir, who was an opposition-based prime minister. Ayatollah Khomeini was invited back to Iran by the government and returned to Tehran to a greeting by several million Iranians. The royal reign collapsed shortly after and on the 11th of February, when guerrillas and rebel troops overwhelmed troops, overwhelmed troops loyal to the Shah in armed street fighting, bringing Khomeini to official power. Iran voted by national referendum to become an Islamic Republic on the 1st of April, 1979, and to formulate and approve a new theocratic Republican constitution, whereby Khomeini became supreme leader and the country in December, 1979. Here's a question that came into my mind that um, I don't know if anybody has the answer, it just wasn't something that came up before in my thoughts, but I've seen this, you, it's, it becomes an Islamic Republic. Does anybody, there, there must be a difference, but does anybody understand the difference between the Islamic Republic and an Islamic state? Because either which way it's going to be ruled by Islamic rule, is that right, uh, law? Question. I don't know. Okay. Okay. I'm just trying to sort out the different things that go on in the Middle East. Um, anyways, I'll leave it at that for now. So the revolution was unusual for the surprise it created throughout the world. It lacked many of the customary causes of revolution, defeat in war, financial crisis, peasant rebellion, or disgruntled um, military, occurred in a nation that was experiencing relative prosperity, produced profound change at great speed, was massively popular, resulted in the exile of many Iranians, 
and place of pro-Western authoritarian monarchy with an anti-replaced um, pro-Western authoritarian monarchy with an anti-Western theocracy based on the concept of uh, guardianship of the Islamic jurist. It was relatively non a relatively nonviolent revolution and it helped to redefine the meaning and practice of modern revolutions, although there was violence in its aftermath. I haven't watched it yet, but I just found a video for three minutes and 36 seconds that actually has a Islamic State versus the Islamic Republic. Oh, awesome. If you'd send that to me or put it in the chat too, I'll watch it later. Okay. I just, it just occurred to me there must be a difference because we see the different things going on and, and, and uh, I would like to understand what the difference is. But everybody went against Iran just the same as they went against um, ISIS, the, the same as, as in the same. So it's interesting. So we're going to do a little bit of background to building to that point um, through some of this history. Um, and the Shia clergy or the ulama, if we remember, they were the learned ones, the scholars, have historically had a significant influence in Iran. The clergy first showed themselves to be a powerful political force. So they're clergy, they're the religious ones. They're a powerful political force in opposition to Iran's monarch with the 1891 tobacco protest boycott that effectively destroyed an unpopular concession granted by the Shah, giving the British company a monopoly over buying and selling tobacco in Iran. To some, the incident demonstrated that the Shia ulama were Iran's first line of defense against colonialism. I think that's another word to kind of look at too, because you had the British, if I'm understanding what I've been reading right, the British were colonizing it, it, all these places. And then it seems that later you have the U.S. come in after the British, just like we have our problems. We had our problems with the British. The British were doing these things in the Middle East, and then now it's first it was them causing problems, and then it's the U.S. causing problems. So Riza Shah, um, the dynasty that the revolution overthrew, the Pahlavi dynasty, was known for its autocracy. Uh, auto, I hope I said that one. Autocracy. Its focus on modernization and westernization, as well as its disregard for religious and democratic measures in Iran's constitution. So if you're an Islamic nation and you have a monarchy, authoritarian monarchy that is pro-modernization and westernization, that's going to make the conservatives and the religious ones angry. The founder of the dynasty, Arm, Army General Riza Shah Pahlavi, replaced Islamic laws with Western ones and forbade traditional Islamic clothing, separation of the sexes, and veiling of women. Um, women were, who resisted his ban on public hijab had their, I'm not sure what this word was, kadors, forcibly removed and torn. In 1935, a rebellion by pious Shia at the shrine of Iman Riza in Mashhad was crushed on his orders with dozens killed and hundreds injured, rupturing relations between the Shah and the pious Shia in Iran. This was um, the father of the Shah of Iran that were... If you guys could mute your mic, that would be great. Let's see if I can find it. I think they got it. Okay. Um, okay. So the um, so anyway, so this this he is for pro Westernization, pro modernization, and now we have a problem between the Shia religious ones, the pious ones in Iran. And the last Shah of Iran comes to power. Riza Shah was deposed in 1941 by an invasion of allied British and Soviet troops who believed him to be sympathetic with the allies' enemy, Nazi Germany. His son, Mohammad Riza Pahlavi, was installed by the allies as monarch. Prince 
Pahlavi, later Crown Shaw, reigned until the 1979 revolution with one brief interruption. In 1953, he fled the country after a power struggle with his prime minister, Mohammad Mosaddegh. Mosaddegh is remembered in Iran for having been voted into power through a democratic election, nationalizing Iran's British owned oil fields and being deposed in a military coup d'etat organized by an American CIA operative and aided by the British M16, MI, MI6 or MI, M16? MI6, I think. Thus, foreign. Yes, MI6. Yeah. Thank you. Thus, foreign powers were involved in both the installation and restoration of Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. So he's favored by the US. His father um, seemed to be sympathetic to the Nazis. Um, and he has a brief time here where there's an opposition happening with a democratic election um, and the CIA is involved. So I thought it was this kind of connects you building your way to 1959 that brings you to um, Saddam. So, so in 1953, um, you have CIA interaction to, um, in this military coup um, to get rid of a demo democratically elected um, official to put him in power. The Shah maintained a close relationship with the United States, both regimes sharing a fear of the southward expansion of the Soviet state Iran's powerful northern neighbor. Leftists and Islamist groups attacked his government, often from outside Iran, as they were suppressed within for violating the Iranian constitution, political corruption, and the political oppression by the Sadiq, which is the secret police. So he shut down any kind of revolt or any speaking out against the government. And that eventually brings you to um, Khomeini, and why he was not in Iran, but still um, building up to the point where they would welcome him back. So during World War II, we have Iran claimed to be a neutral country during the opening years of World War II. In April 1941, the war reached Iran's borders when Rashid Ali, uh, with assistance from Germany and Italy, launched the 1941 Iraqi coup d'etat, sparking the Anglo-Iraqi War of May 1941. Germany and Italy sent the pro-Axis forces in Iraq military aid from Syria, but during the period from May to July, the British and their allies defeated the pro-Axis forces in Iraq and later Syria and Lebanon. In June 1941, Nazi Germany broke the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and invaded the Soviet Union, Iran's northern neighbor. The Soviets quickly allied themselves with the allied countries. And in July and August 1941, the British demanded that the Iranian government expel all Germans from Iran. Reza Shah refused to expel the Germans. And this is where they saw him as being sympathetic to Nazi Germany. Um, he refused to expel the Germans, and on 25th of August 1941, the British and Soviets launched a surprise invasion, and Reza Shah's government quickly surrendered after less than a week of fighting. The invasion's strategic purpose was to secure a supply line to the USSR, later named the Persian Corridor, secure the oil fields and Abaddon refinery of the UK-owned Anglo-Iranian oil company, and limit German influence in Iran. Following the invasion on the 16th of September, 1941, Reza Shah abdicated and was replaced by Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, his 21-year-old son. In 1953, we have the Iranian coup d'etat known as, known in Iran as the 28th Mordad coup d'etat. Uh, the democratically elected Prime Minister Mohammad Mosaddegh in favor of strengthening the monarchical rule of, of the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, on the 19th of August, 1953, orchestrated by the United States under the name, I'm not sure how to say that, to Dutch project or Operation Ajax, and by the United Kingdom as well, um, carried out um, by the Iranian military. Mosaddegh, 
had sought to audit the documents of the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, a British corporation, now part of BP, and to limit the company's control over Iranian oil reserves. Upon the refusal of the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company to cooperate with the Iranian government, the parliament voted to nationalize Iran's oil industry and to expel foreign corporate representatives from the country. <clears throat> After this vote, Britain instigated a worldwide boycott of Iranian oil to pressure Iran economically. Initially, Britain mobilized its military to seize control of the British-built Abaddon oil refinery, then the world's largest, but Prime Minister Clement Attlee opted instead to tighten the economic boycott while using Iranian agents to undermine Mossadegh's government. Judging Mossadegh to be unreliable and, a, and fearing a communist takeover in Iran, UK Prime Minister Winston Churchill and the Eisenhower administration decided to overthrow Iran's government, though the preceding Truman administration had opposed a coup, fearing the president the precedent that the CIA involvement would set. British intelligence officials' conclusions and the UK government solicitations were instrumental in initiating and planning the coup, despite the fact that the US government in 1952 had been considering unilateral action without UK support to assist the Mossadegh government. So everybody has a complicated history. Did somebody have a question or a comment? Okay. Allison put in there, the phrase coup d'etat comes from French, literally meaning a stroke of state or blow against the state. In French, the word etat uh, denoting the sovereign political entity is capitalized. They over, basically that's an overthrow of the leader, right? And the government and they put somebody else in place. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. So following the coup in 1953, a government under General Fazloa Zihada, Zahida, was formed, which allowed Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the last Shah of Iran, or the Persian for Iranian king, to rule more firmly as monarch. He relied heavily on the United States support to hold on to power. According to the CIA's declassified documents and records, some of the most feared mobsters in Tehran were hired by the CIA to stage pro-Shah riots on the 19th of August. Other men paid by the CIA were brought into Tehran, Tehran in buses and trucks and took over the streets of the city. Between 200 and 300 people were killed because of the conflict. Mossadegh was arrested, tried, and convicted by, of treason by the Shah's military court. On the 21st of December, 1953, he was sentenced to three years in jail, then placed under house arrest for the remainder of his life. Other Mossadegh supporters were imprisoned and several received the death penalty. After the coup, the Shah continued his rule as monarch for the next 26 years until he was overthrown by the Iranian revolution in 1979. And again, it's like, having to juggle all these things because while well, you've got the US and the CIA involved in this relationship here, it was just back at 1945 when the US made a deal with Saudi Arabia, uh, the oil for security um, pact as well. So you can see that we know the US is firmly setting up its, uh, how do you, spear, setting up spheres of influence, but wanting its foothold on the Middle East. In August 2013, 60 years afterward, 60 years afterward, the US government formally acknowledged the US role in the coup by releasing a bulk of previously classified government documents that show it was in charge of both the planning and the execution of the coup, including the bribing of Iranian politicians, security and army high-ranking officials, as well as pro-coup propaganda. The CIA has quoted acknowledging the coup was carried out under CIA direction and as an act of US foreign policy conceived and approved at the highest levels of government. Next we have uh, 
the white revolution during this period of the Shah. The white revolution was a far reaching series of reforms in Iran launched in 1963 by the Shah of Iran and lasted until 1978. Mohammad Reza Shah's reform program was built especially to weaken those classes that supported the traditional system. In, it consisted of several elements, including land reform, sales of some state-owned factories to finance the land reform, the enfranchisement of women, nationalization of forests and pastures, formation of a literacy core, and institution of profit-sharing schemes for workers in industry. The Shah advertised the White Revolution as steps as a step towards westernization, and it was a way for him to legitimize the Pahlavi dynasty. Part of the reason for launching the White Revolution was that the Shah hoped to get rid of the influence of landlords and to create a new base of support among the peasants and working class. Thus, the White Revolution in Iran was an attempt to introduce reform from above and preserve traditional power patterns. Through land reform, the essence of the White Revolution, the Shah hoped to ally himself with the peasantry in the countryside and hoped to sever their ties with the aristocracy in the city. What the Shah did not expect, however, was that the White Revolution led to new social tensions that helped create many of the problems the Shah had been trying to avoid. The Shah's reforms more than quadrupled and combined size of the two classes that had posed the most challenges to his monarchy in the past. The intelligentsia and the urban working class. Their resentments toward the Shah also grew as they were now stripped of organizations that had represented them in the past, such as political parties, professional associations, trade unions, and independent newspapers. The land reform, instead of allying the peasants with the government, produced large numbers of independent farmers and landless laborers who became loose political cannons with no feeling of loyalty to the Shah. Many of the masses felt resentment towards the increasingly corrupt government and their loyalty to the clergy, who were seen as more concerned with the fate of the populace, remained consistent or increased. As Urban Abrahamian, Abrahamian pointed out, the White Revolution had been designed to preempt a Red Revolution. Instead, it paved the way for an Islamic Revolution. The White Revolution's economic trickle-down strategy also did not work as intended. In theory, oil money funneled to the elite was supposed to be used to create jobs and factories, eventually distributing the money. But instead, the wealth tended to get stuck at the top and concentrated in the hands of the very few. That sounds very familiar. Definitely. This is what's going on here yeah. in America. Yeah. So the rise and the exile of Ayatollah Khomeini, um, the post-revolutionary leader, Shia cleric Ayatollah Khomeini, first came to political prominence in 1963 when he led opposition to the Shah in his white revolution, which aimed to break up land holdings owned by some Shia clergy allow women to vote and religious minorities to hold office, and finally grant women legal equality in marital, marital status. Khomeini was arrested in 1963 after declaring the Shah a wretched, miserable man who had embarked on the path toward destruction of Islam in Iran. Three days of major riots throughout Iran followed with 15,000 dead from police fire as reported by opposition sources. However, anti-revolutionary sources conjectured that just about 32 were killed. Khomeini was released after eight months of house arrest and continued his agitation, condemning Iran's cooperation with Israel and its capitulations or extension of diplomatic immunity to American government personnel in Iran. In November 1964, Khomeini was rearrested and sent into exile, where he remained for 15 years, mostly in Najaf, Iraq, until the revolution.
and ideology, that's one that we talked about Wednesday night too, understanding the ideology of the King of the North and the King of the South. So we need to keep that in mind for our line that we're going to start to build as well, because the ideology um, in the, like you talked about on Wednesday, in the um, Soviet Afghan war was different than, is different than the ideology in the current Syrian war. So the ideology of the Iranian revolution. In this interim period of disaffected calm, the budding Iranian revival began to undermine the idea of westernization as progress that was the basis of the Shah's secular reign and to form the ideology of the 1979 revolution. Jalal El Ahmad's idea of, I'm gonna trample that one, sorry. That Western culture was a plague or an intoxication to be eliminated. Um, his vision of Islam as the one true liberator of the third world from oppression, colo oppressive colonialism, neo-colonialism, and capitalism, and Mortiza Matari's popularized retellings of the Shia faith all spread and gained listeners, readers, and supporters. Most importantly, Khomeini preached revolt and especially martyrdom against injustice and tyranny was part of Shia Islam and the, that Muslims should reject the influence of both liberal capitalism and communism. Ideas that inspired the revolutionary slogan, neither East nor West, but Islamic Republic. Away from public view, Khomeini developed the ideology of the guardianship of the jurists as government that Muslims, in fact, everyone required guardianship in the form of rule or supervision by the leading Islamic jurists or jurists. Such rule was ultimately more necessary even than prayer and fasting in Islam, as it would protect Islam from deviation from traditional Sharia law, and in so doing, eliminate poverty, injustice, and the plundering of Muslim land by foreign non-believers. This idea by rule of rule by Islamic jurists was spread through his book, Islamic Government, mosque sermons and smuggled cassette speeches by Khomeini among his opposition network of students, ex-students, able clerics such as Mortiza Matahari, Muhammad Balashi, I'm gonna skip some of those names, you guys can try to read them if you want, and traditional businessmen inside Iran. So he's basically got his own propaganda machine going on against the Shah when it comes to um, getting westernization and modernization out of there. Um, he's doing this from, because he was exiled in Iraq, so he's not in Iran, and you're in Iran, you're not allowed to speak against um, the government, and there's punishment for that. So he's in Iraq speaking out. Um, so other opposition groups included constitutionalist liberals, the democratic reformist Islamic freedom movement of Iran, headed by Badi Bazargan, and the more secular National Front. They were based in the urban middle class and wanted the Shah to adhere to the Iranian constitution of 1906, rather than to replace him with a theocracy, but lacked the cohesion and organization of Khomeini's forces. The Marxist groups, primarily the communist Tuda Party of Iran and the Fidian guerrillas had been weakened considerably by government repression. Despite this, the guerrillas did help play an important part in the final February 79 overthrow, delivering the regime its coup de grace. The most powerful guerrilla group, the People's Mujahideen, was leftist Islamist and opposed the influence of the clergy as reactionary. Some important clergy did not follow Khomeini's lead. Popular Ayatollah Muhammad Talagani supported the left while perhaps the most senior and influential Ayatollah in Iran, in Iran um, first remained aloof from politics and then came out in support of a democratic revolution. Khomeini worked to unite this opposition behind him, except for the unwanted atheist Marxists, focusing on the socioeconomic problems of the Shah's government, corruption and unequal income and development, while avoiding specifics among the public that might divide the factions, 
particularly his plan for clerical rule, which he believed most Iranians had become prejudiced against as a result of propaganda campaign by Western imperialists. In the post-Shah era, some revolutionaries who clashed with his theocracy and were suppressed by his movement complained of deception. But in the meantime, anti-Shah unity was maintained. And I thought it was interesting when you, because when you look at what's going on in the United States now, is that you, I think in any circumstance, you always have all, everybody has their different, you know, like when we see the protests, there's different factions that are participating in this protest. But soon things get bad enough to where the different factions don't worry about some of their, or all of their issues, and they all can come together on one main issue. And then they can become a powerful force. And that's what I think they're saying, what we're seeing here is they, they eventually come together, um, just although they have all these different factions, they all come together on one common cause and they become this big force. But what happens after the fact, you know, if they, when they're successful, is that after the fact, everybody goes back to having their own ideas and their own opinions. And you still, so you're gonna have continued problems. Several events in the 70s set the stage for the 1979 revolution. In 1971, 2,500 year celebration of the Persian Empire um, organized by the government was attacked for its extravagance. As the foreigners reveled on drink forbidden by Islam, Iranians were not only excluded from the festivities, some were starving. Five years later, the Shah angered pious Iranian Muslims by changing the first year of the Iranian solar calendar from the Islamic Hijri to the ascension of the throne by Cyrus the Great. Iran jumped overnight from Muslim year 1355 to the royalist year 2535. The oil boom of the 70s produced an alarming increase in inflation, waste, and accelerating gap between the rich and the poor, the city and the country along with the presence of tens of thousands of unpopular skilled foreign workers. Many Iranians were also angered by the fact that the Shah's family was the foremost beneficiary of the income generated by oil and the line between state earnings and family earnings blurred. By 1976, the Shah had accumulated upward of $1 billion from oil revenue. His family, including 63 princes and princesses, had accumulated between five and $20 billion, and the family foundation controlled approximately $3 billion. By mid-1977, economic austerity measures to fight inflation disproportionately affected the thousands of poor and unskilled male migrants settling in the cities, working in the construction industry. Culturally and religiously conservative, conservative Many went on to form the core of the revolution's demonstrators and martyrs. All Iranians were required to join and pay dues to a new political party. Um, all other parties were banned. That party's attempt to fight inflation with populist anti-profiting campaigns, fining and jailing merchants for high prices, angered and politicized merchants while fueling black markets. In 1977, the Shah responded to the polite reminder of the importance of political rights by the American, new American president, Jimmy Carter, by granting amnesty to some prisoners and allowing the Red Cross to visit prisoners. Through 1977, liberal opposition formed organizations and issued open letters denouncing the government. Against this background, a first crucial manifestation of public expression of social discontent and political protest against the regime took place in October of 77, when the German Iranian Culture Association in Tehran hosted a series of liter literature reading sessions organized by the newly revived Iranian Writers Association and the German uh, Gethi Institute. In these 10 nights, um, 57 of Iran's most prominent poets and writers read their works to thousands of listeners. They demanded the end of censorship and claimed the freedom of expression. 
Also in 1977, the popular and influential modernist Islamist theorist um, died under mysterious circumstances. This both angered his followers who considered him a martyr at the hands of Savik, that was the secret police, and removed a potential, well, potential revolutionary rival to Khomeini. Finally, in October, Khomeini's son Mustafa died of an alleged heart attack, and his death was also blamed by Savik. A subsequent memorial service for Mustafa in Tehran put Khomeini back in the spotlight. So you can see things progressing and building. There's a separation between the classes. Um, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and there's more poor um, out of proportion here. And there, people are wanting to revolt and exercise their rights. The poets, if I remember right, the poets were um, using their poetry also to said, express their freedom of expression. They were, I think, speaking against the government through poetry too, if I remember right. Okay, I don't know if we'll go through all of this, but we'll um, get through parts of it. I don't know that we need every detail um, and it'll be in your notes for you if you want to go through it, but we'll kind of go through and see where we get through it. So January through July, this is 1977, was the last year we were just looking at. The journalists, intellectuals, lawyers, and political activists published a series of open letters criticizing the accumulation of power the hands of the Shah. In October, a 10-night poetry festival organized by the Iranian Writers Association um, in Tehran attracts thousands of participants for lectures criticizing the government. So they were criticizing in what they were saying. So Mostafa in October 23, um, Khomeini, that's the son of Ayatollah Khomeini, he um, um, dies of unknown causes at the age of 47. And the elder Khomeini, has lived in exile since uh, 1963 in Iraq when he was arrested for leading protests against the Shah's modernization program. November 15th and 16th during a visit to Washington, the Shah's welcome at the White House is disrupted by protests by Iranian students as well as the tear gas used by police to quash the protests. December 31st, on a brief visit to Iran, President Jimmy Carter toasts the Shah, describing Iran as an island of stability in one of the most troubled areas of the world. And in, in looking back at where we began here with um, understanding that, that his father, the Shah's father, was um, known to be or seemed to be um, sympathetic of the Nazis, that it's the CIA that actually um, orchestrates the coup to remove his father, and they and he winds up in power. Uh, was that right? Yeah, the United States played a role in it, along with others in that coup. They they um, wanted him, and then the '63 is when the CIA. Sorry, '63 is when the CIA um, helped to get rid of the democratically elected Mossadegh um, out and more established the monarchy rule. So it was here we are. If I'm if I'm following things. Here we are as the United States, we escaped the monarchy um, in our history, but for our own gain, we are, um, we are seeking to more firmly establish his monarchy and get rid of the democratically elected official. So it seems really complicated to me to think that we would do so many different things, but everybody acts on their own motives based on what they think is best at the time and what benefits them the most is what it really seems like everything comes down to. Am I understanding that correctly? That's the way I see it. Okay. But surely what we're seeing is that the U.S. I had, I had no idea of all this stuff, how interactive the U.S. is and how going years back, wanting to have their footprint over dominating the Middle East. And you have the same thing with Russia. And from what I've kind of been reading is that Russia, there's a couple articles that imply this. I think we talked about it Wednesday night. They said this and uh, that Russia acts more like, I'm gonna say it the way I understood it. Um, and if and I probably have the document, documents that talked about it, but I'm going to say it the way I understood it. Like the United States is like the big brother and perhaps the Soviet Union is a little brother and the little brother is jealous of the big brother and always wants to try to compete with the big brother. 
So you got the two superpowers. And so there's a, a, a jealousy motive there to be the big, big man on campus. So you have the US wanting to build their spheres of influence in the Middle East and get their foothold down there. And they've got interaction going on with um, Iran and the Saudis and, and, and elsewhere. And then you have um, the, which we'll look at next week, maybe the Soviet invasion where, um, and we talked about that the other night where the Soviets had been feeding in supplies and, and, and such to Afghanistan for their ulterior, ulterior motive to eventually um, turn them into a communist nation. And that brought about the Mujahideen and many others to the religious um, conservatives to fight, start fighting against it. And then the, the communist friendly government that was put in place is asking the Soviets to come and um, save us from these Mujahideen that brought in the Soviet invasion. So you've got them, what we do see is a theme of having to have, wanting to have their foothold and, and who can have the bigger part of the Middle East or have the whole Middle East? Somebody want to say something? So January 6th, Iranian newspaper um, publishes a front page editorial disparaging um, Khomeini reportedly written by the Royal Court at the directive of the Shah. This is 1978. Um, Got it, okay. Um, in January 9th, the main bazaar in Palm, where Iran's largest seminaries are based, closed to protest the defamation of Khomeini. Several thousand protesters attack, attack symbols of the monarchy. Security forces kill at least five people. So He's been building a following during this time from when we saw that with the opposition forces and such. We saw that he's building this following and these different factions are kind of starting to all come together in support of being against um, uh, the Shah. The Shah's doing, you know, separating the classes um, between the rich and the poor and pocketing basically the oil money and not benefiting the people. Um, and the Shah is with, you got all these different factions that are upset about that. You can wind up getting behind the cause, not really knowing what the cause <laughs> really wants in the end, but you can be a part of a cause because of the same circumstances that you're all put under. So, so now they're starting there, you can see them um, sniping back and forth basically. So February 18th, consistent with Shah tradition, morning ceremonies are held in cities across Iran on the 40th day following the death of calm protesters, a student protester is killed in Tabriz, provoking riots and further violence. In March through May, the cycle of protest, repression, violence, and mourning continues in three dozen Iranian cities. June 7th, the Shah replaces General um, Nazari, the head of the Sabak, that was the secret police. One of his successors' moves was to order the release of 300 detained clerics. Um, July 20th, protests erupt in Mashhad after the death of a cleric in a road accident. A number of people were killed in the upheaval there and elsewhere. August 9th through 10th, the arrest of a cleric provokes riots in Isfahan, which quickly spread to Shiraz. Um, I'm going to skip those names. Um, the Shiraz Art Festival is canceled and an estimated 100 are kill killed. Martial law is declared um, in Isfahan. Ishvahan. Forgive me, Lord, you guys. <laughs> it's hard with all these names. Um, August 19, 477 Iranians die in a deliberately set fire at the Cinema Rex in Abaddon. The opposition blamed Savik after the revolution, an Islamist confessed and was prosecuted for the arson. And if I understood correctly, it was a theater and movie theater and we know that Islam is against that. It's part of your modernization, your westernization that's going to corrupt people. Um, so there's a fire started in there deliberately and 477 Iranians die. October 27th, Prime Minister um, Amuziger resigns his successor, uh, undertakes reforms intended to assuage. September 8th, 
On the morning after the Shah declared martial law, security forces fire on a large protest in Tehran's uh, Jalil Square. At least 100 were killed, and the event became known as Black Friday. October 3rd, at the Shah's behest, the Iraqi government deports Khomeini After he's denied entry to Kuwait, Khomeini travels to France and settles, um, uh, I'll leave that word again to a, a Parisian um, suburb where he benefits from far greater media access and attention. So he's now moved into France um, and it's, he's getting more attention in France than he was in Iraq. November 6, days after protests swell in Tehran on a religious holiday, Efforts to broker a national unity government with the opposition collapsed thanks to Khomeini's defiance. Prime Minister um, Sharif Amani resigned, succeeded by uh, Azari. The Shah broadcast on national television a promise not to repeat past mistakes and to make amends saying, I heard the voice of your revolution. As Shah of Iran, as well as an Iranian citizen, I cannot but approve your revolution. December 6, only a week after he publicly reaffirmed U.S. support and confidence in the Shah, President Jimmy Carter publicly hedges in press statements, noting that we personally prefer that the Shah maintain a major role, but that is a decision for the Iranian people to make. So Carter was um, supportive of him, but he's kind of waffling a little bit and saying that the Iranian people need to decide what is best. December 10th. In 11th, millions of Iranians protest all over the country demanding the removal of the Shah and the return of, of, the, of Ayatollah Khomeini. December 29th, the Shah appoints um, Bakhtir the, his, as prime minister, a longtime nationalist politician and vocal critic of the Shah. He is confirmed by the parliament, parliament two weeks later. January 12th in Paris, Ayatollah Khomeini forms the Revolutionary Council to coordinate the transition. So, he'll be heading back in. So Shah and his family leave Iran for Egypt, ostensibly for vacation. As he departs, the Shah tells Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, I give Iran into your care, yours and God's. On February 1, um, just two weeks later, Khomeini returns to Iran and is greeted by millions of people in the streets of Tehran. It makes me think about what, again, what we see in the United States how you have these many factions uniting for um, a common cause, but it doesn't eliminate all their their own personal beliefs and 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 uh, and, and issues that they have. So you got people asking for something. When we look at when we look at the people that are in deception by this government and by the far right and all. That, I mean, it's heartbreaking to witness the deception some of us have are witnessing in our own families and it's very heartbreaking to watch and all you can do is pray that the lord would draw them unto himself but but if we could just reach out and say be careful what you ask for because you're asking for something and you don't really understand what you're going to wind up getting and so in some sense that's what what a lot of these people wound up doing is asking for something, but they didn't really realize what they were going to wind up getting in the end. Um, February 4th, Khomeini appoints um, Bazargan as prime minister of an interim government. Um, Bakhtir insists that he remains the head of the only legitimate Iranian government. February 10th, he announces countrywide curfew and martial law. Khomeini orders his followers to ignore the curfew and rise up in national revolution. February 11th, the armed forces declare neutrality and any remnants of the Shah's government collapse. Um, Bakhtir, Bakhtir quickly fled Iran for France where he was assassinated in 1991 by Iranian agents. The provisional government, February 14, the US embassy in Tehran is attacked by crowds. Embassy staff initially surrender but the protesters were ousted on the order of Iran's acting foreign minister. March 8th, tens of thousands of Iranian women protest in Tehran on International Women's Day to, impose, to oppose mandatory bailing. And I put a link there for you on that one as well. So 
because the, the Shah was, and beginning back with his father as well, with his westernization and modernization, they had given women's rights in um, the religious, the religious um, clerics come in and they want strong, strict Sharia law. And now the women are gonna lose their rights. Iranians participate, March 30th to 31st, Iranians participate in a national referendum on whether Iran should become an Islamic Republic the motion, which offered no alternatives, received near unanimous support. May 5th, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is established by a decree issued by Khomeini. August 3rd, Iranians vote in nationwide elections for the Assembly of Experts, a clerical dominated body empowered to finalize the draft constitution. Due to boycotts by leftists, nationalists, and some Islamist factions, voter turnout falls far below the March referendum. October 14th, Assembly of Experts approves draft new constitution enshrining Khomeini's innovative doctrine of, uh, and that was, I think the, I think that was the, the guardianship of the jurist, I think if I remember right that one, which, which accords ultimately authority to a religious leader. Yeah, the guardian of the jurist. Um, so which accords ultimately ultimate authority to the religious leader. And I think we talked about that the other night too, that he gets his direction directly from God, and that's what the people are to do, to believe and to do. Um, October 22nd, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi is allowed to enter the U.S. for medical treatment. Khomeini condemns the U.S. for allowing the deposed Shah entry into the country. Now we have the hostage crisis. November 4th, student protesters overrun the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, seizing its personal personnel as hostages. November 6th, the leaders of Iran's provisional government resign in protest, ceding uncontested authority of the new state to Khomeini and the Revolutionary Council. November 7th, U.S. President Jimmy Carter sends emissaries with a personal note to Iran to negotiate the release of, hostages, of the hostages, but they are refused entry. November 14th, the U.S. freezes all property and interest in the government of Iran and the Central Bank of Iran. November 19th to 20th, 13 female and American, African American hostages are released in a unilateral Iranian gesture. December 2nd to the 3rd, Iran's new constitution overwhelmingly approved in a popular referendum that drew participation from 75% of the electorate. December 4th, the United Nations Security Council passes a resolution calling for Iran to release the hostages. December 15th, the Shah leaves the United States for Panama. January 25th, um, Sadra is elected as Islamic Republic's first president. Within 18 months, he would be impeached and flee the country. March 14th, the Iranians vote in parliamentary actions with a second round held in May. April 7th, U.S. formally severs diplomatic relations with Iran. April 25th, Operation Eagle Claw Embassy Hostage Rescue Mission fails after sandstorms cause the crash of one of the helicopters and the death of eight U.S. soldiers. On April 28th, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance announces his resignation submitted to President Carter four days before the rescue operation was launched. July 9th, Iranian authorities discover a coup plot and launch a new purge of the military. July 27th, um, the Shah of Iran dies in Cairo, Egypt. September 12th, in a speech, I told many outlines the preconditions for an agreement. On September 22nd, Iraq invades Iran, setting off an eight-year conflict that resulted in hundreds of thousands of casualties on both sides. So we talked about this, I think, as well on Wednesday night when Iraq invades Iran. Um, Iraq, um, I think it was... Um, might have been Brother Jim that looked it up, that um, Iraq's majority was Shia. Um, Saddam is Sunni. And seeing what the Shia, this big Shia revolt did in uh, this Islamic revolution brought about in Iran, uh, Saddam Hussein did not want that to spill over to the Shia population in Iraq. And so he took advantage of the chaos that he presumed that Iran would be under with all this, um, with the revolution and the overturning of the Shah and the rising up of Khomeini, that they would be in disarray and he took advantage and went in to attack 
um, Iran. And that is the beginning of the Iran-Iraq war. And it's during this war that chemical weapons were used that were supplied to Saddam by the US. January 20th, 1980, all remaining US hostages are released after 444 days um, after Tehran and Washington concluded the Algiers Accords. The agreement unfreezes Iranian assets, lifts other US sanctions on Iran, and establishes a tribunal to adjudicate billions of dollars of financial claims between the two countries. Okay, any comments or questions? This part is fairly short, mostly a timeline. Take a pause before we jump into anybody comments. Okay, we'll keep going. Everybody's awake. We're awake, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Gotta make sure everyone's um. <laughs> okay. So the Iran-Iraq war. So we saw the Iranian revolution and what it caused um, within the Middle East and what now it's brought Saddam Hussein to do. And this is where, for me, it's like trying to juggle everything and to keep straight that you had, like I said, at the same time you have the Iran-Iraq war go. Some of you probably already well knew this because I am so naive and didn't pay attention to any history or events that were taking place as they were taking place, but that um, at the same time that this Iran-Iraq war was going on, at the same time the Soviets invade Afghanistan. And the thing that I'm still trying, maybe somebody has some insight to, to grapple with and understand, because um, this, the Soviet Union and the United States and many others, Iran basically had no supporters, few supporters but pretty much everybody supported Saddam Hussein in this matter. But while at the same time, you have the Soviets invading Afghanistan and trying to um, bring them to be a communist nation, bring them into their spheres of influence, that the United States, Saudi Arabia, um, they're all against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. So I still struggle with trying to figure out why and who other than, other than for their own personal gain, why they choose to support who they do. It never seems to be for the greater good of all people. It always seems to have to benefit somebody. So anyway, so the two wars are, are happening at the same time. So. Just one comment by Troy. He said the release of those prisoners was on the day of the inauguration of Ronald Reagan. Oh, nice. Yeah, I think I remember that. I think I remember that. Somebody posted, um, just kind of off topic, but somebody posted in the WhatsApp group um, after Elder Parminder's presentation that it was uh, August 15th, Behold the Bridegroom Cometh. <laughs> I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> Millerite history, you know. Right, cause today's the 15th, okay. Yeah, today's 15th. So the Iran-Iraq War, um, first Gulf War, referred to as the imposed war and holy defense or, or sacred defense. Um, September 22nd, 1980, when Iraq invaded Iran and it ended the 20th of August, 18, 1988, when Iran accepted the UN brokered ceasefire. Iraq wanted to replace Iran as the dominant Persian Gulf state and was worried the 1979 Iranian revolution would lead Iraq's Shia majority, there it is right there, Brother Jim, thank you, um, Shia majority to rebel against the Ba'athist government. The war also followed in what we studied the other night with, with the notes of Saddam Hussein um, and, and, the, and there we, we at least came to understand that there's different factions of the Ba'athist government. There's the Ba'athist in Syria and there's the Ba'athist in Iraq, um, but that it was the Ba'athist party that the U.S. was actually supporting and helping when after, let me make sure I get this straight, after 2003 in the, 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 I have them all mixed up in my head, but at, when we went in after um, Saddam Hussein and then after we took him out 
and the statue came down, then we took the Baptist party out. So what we once supported, we turn around and defeat and take out. So, um, so, um, so Saddam was worried that the Iranian revolution would lead Iraq's Shia majority to rebel against the Baptist government. The war also followed a long history of border disputes in Iraq plan to annex the oil rich um, Khuzestan province and the East Bank of the Shat al Arab. I think this is the notes that goes through that, um, that river. We talked about it a couple of times before. No, not river, but a waterway. Um, so these two things are what it's, it's, it goes back through a history of these border disputes and these um, border disputes go way back between um, Iraq and Iran. And Iraq actually didn't exist until, I wanna say, I think it was the 1900s. So although Iraq hoped, it was part of the Ottoman Empire, although Iraq hoped to take advantage of, Iraq's, of Iran's post-revolutionary chaos, it made limited progress and was quickly repelled Iran regained virtually all lost territory by June 1982. For the next five years, Iran was on the offensive until Iraq took back the initiative in 1988 and whose major offenses led to the final conclusion of the war. There were a number of proxy forces, most notably the People's Mujahideen of Iran, siding with Iraq. So you've got the Mujahideen of Iran that are actually siding with Iraq and the Iraqi Kurdish militias of the KDP, KDP and the PUK siding with Iran. The United States, Britain, the Soviet Union, France, and most Arab countries provided political and logistic support for Iraq while Iran was largely isolated. And we know that it was um, that Kuwait um, Iraq went, Saddam went into great debt over this and um, Kuwait helped fund a lot of it and that's what later brought him to um, going after, um, go um, invade Kuwait after this. After eight years of war, war exhaustion, economic devastation, decreased morale, military stalemate, lack of international sympathy against the use of weapons of mass destruction, against civilians by Iraqi forces and increased U.S.-Iran military tension all led to a ceasefire brokered by the United Nations. The conflict has been compared to World War I in terms of the tactics used, including large-scale trench warfare with barbed wire stretched across fortified defensive lines, manned machine gun posts, bayonet charges, Iranian human wave attacks, extensive use of chemical weapons by Iraq, and later deliberate attacks on civilian targets. And if I remember right, both sides did that. A special feature of the war can be seen in the Iranian cult of the martyr, which had been developed in the years before the revolution. The discourses on martyrdom formulated in the Iranian Shia context led to the tactics of human wave attacks and thus had a lasting impact on the dynamics of the war. There's a couple of videos you can watch on that too, on the human wave attacks. An estimated 500,000 Iraqi and Iranian soldiers died in addition to a smaller number of civilians. The end of the war resulted in neither reparations nor border changes. So basically all that death and for nothing. So you have um, Iran and its supporters. Um, you see Hezbollah there, um, Islamic Dawah party, and then you have Iraq and who's supporting um, Iraq, um, and we have the U.S. here, I don't have it on there, or it's not on this particular one, but who supports who? Um, kind of have to flip those down, but I can't do that on this one. On the website you can, so. Okay, so here's the, the river that I was talking about. It's made by a confluence of the tide. What's a confluence? Does anybody know what a confluence is? Did we talk about that once before? See where the rivers come together. Okay. There's the Euphrates. Okay, okay, yeah. The Euphrates and the Tigris. And it comes down here and it goes this way. Because this is the one that we're talking about. Okay. Um, uh, made by the confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates River um, and continues to the to the end up to the Persian Gulf south of the city of Alpha. And that was down here. 
and it takes you down into the Persian Gulf. The river may have formed 2,000 to 1,600 years prior to the 21st century. The background of the issue stretches mainly back to the Ottoman Safavid era prior to the establishment of an independent Iraq, which happened in the 20th century. In the early 16th century, the Iranian Safavids gained most of what is present-day Iraq, but lost it later by the peace of Amasa, 1955, to the expanding Ottomans, 1555 to the expanding Ottomans. In the early 17th century, the Safavids under King Abbas from 1588 to 1629 regained it only to lose it permanently along temporarily with control over the waterway to the Ottomans by the Treaty of Zuhab. This treaty, which roughly reestablished the common borders of the Ottoman and Safavid empires the way they had been in 1555, never demarcated a precise and fixed boundary regarding the frontier in the south. Um, Nader Shah restored Iranian control over the waterway, but the Treaty of Kurdan, 1746, restored the Zuhab boundaries and ceded it back to the Turks. The first treaty of Erzurum, 1823, concluded between Ottoman Turkey and Qajar Iran resulted in the same. The second treaty of Izram was signed by Ottoman Turkey and Qajar, Iran in 1847 after protracted negotiations which included British and Russian delegates. Even afterwards, backtracking and disagreements continued until British Foreign Secretary Lord Palmerston was moved to comment in 1851 that the boundary line between Turkey and Persia can never be finally settled except by an arbitrary decision on the part of Great Britain and Russia. A protocol between the Ottomans and the Persians was signed in Istanbul in 1913, which declared that the Ottoman-Persian frontier run along the Thalweg, but World War I canceled all plans. And I did look up Thalweg because I didn't know what that was either. Um, that's the, the deepest, most portion of, if that's how to say the right word, of the river. So as a river flows through, it's the deepest part of it and that most nations mark that as a boundary. In geography, the fluvial ge geomorphology, no, I can't even say that word, geomorphology, a thalweg is the line of the lowest evolution within a valley or watercourse. Under international law, a thalweg is the middle of the primary navig navigable channel of a waterway that defines the boundary line between states. Also under international law, thalwegs can acquire special significance because disputed river borders are often deemed to run along the river thalweg. The word thalweg is of 19th century German origin. The German word thalweg um, is a compound noun that is built from the German elements uh, since Duden's orthography reform in 1901, meaning valley. Um, and weg meaning way. It literally means valley way and is used with its modern spelling Talweg in daily Germany to describe a path or a road that follows the bottom of a valley or in geography with a more technical meaning also adopted by English. So it's going to be the, the deepest most portion of the of the um, of the valley that's created and of the water flow. And we know that we, in the previous in the slide right before this last one, it mentioned the Safavid Empire. It did not mention this one, um, but the Ottoman Empire, the two that it was talking about. So you have the Ottoman Empire here, all through here. Um, and then in here is this border that's being talked about right in here um, of that waterway that's created by the Tigris and the Euphrates River. This map makes it look like it's way closer to the Persian Gulf, but um, it's uh, maybe it is, I don't know, maybe the other map was wrong. But anyways, it's by this confluence where the, um, where the Euphrates and Tigris meet and then this waterway takes you out into the Persian Gulf. And if I remember right for Iran, which is this here, Iran, it was the, um, it was the, um, their only access or their only way to the Persian Gulf. Um, and then this being Saudi Arabia and you've got 
Iraq is not existence in here. It's part of the Ottoman Empire. The thing that I did not look up that caught my attention on this particular map that I found and, and may mean something is how it says that it's the gunpowder empires. And, uh, I know that the gunpowder has, because you look at the years, 1370, it's having to do with the Ottoman Empire, and we know that they are the ones that then came up with gunpowder, if I remember right. Is that correct? They first came up with gunpowder? Anybody? I thought it was China. Huh? I thought it was China. It came up with gunpowder? Yeah. It, maybe maybe gunpowder is not what I'm looking for. Maybe I'm, it, I don't know if I'm confusing it, but... Um, because it was the Ottoman Empire in Revelation 9, it talks about in the um, breakdown of the symbols is that they were using guns and weapons. Is that right? The first ones to use guns and weapons in, in a war? Well, it could be that because um, China created gunpowder to look for their fireworks, but it, they weren't the ones who started using it as a weapon. Okay, okay. So maybe it was the Ottoman Empire that started using it as in guns. I don't know if that's an old understanding I heard some long time ago, but I, I, I seem to always remember the Ottoman Empire being the first ones to use um, guns in battle. That, that's possible. I, I don't know the answer to that, but um, the, the China, China was not the first one to start using gunpowder in guns. Somebody okay. else did that. So it could have been them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thinking these maps over, they're helpful to look at. <laughs> so this is the um, what it's called here. Um, the other word it goes by two different names, and I don't have the other one in front of me to look at it. But it's the same same waterway here that it's talking about coming down here, Arban Rudd, and it takes you into the Persian Gulf. You got Iran on this side, and then Iraq. So during the mandate of Iraq, 1920 to 1932. The British advisors in Iraq were able to keep the waterway binational under the Thalweg principle that worked in Europe. The dividing line was a line drawn between the deepest points along the stream bed. In 1937, Iran and Iraq signed a treaty that settled the dispute over the control of the, there's the word, Shat al-Arab. Um, the 1937 treaty recognized the Iranian-Iraqi border as along the low water mark on the eastern side of the Shat al Arab, except at Abadan and Khormashur, where the frontier ran along the Thalweg, the deep water line, which gave Iraq control of almost the entire waterway, provided that all ships using the Shat al, al, al Arab fly the Iraqi flag and have an Iraqi pilot and required Iran to pay tolls to Iraq whenever it ships, its ships use the Shat al-Arab. The Treaty of 30, 1937 marked a familiar pattern by British Empire of divide and rule that was routinely employed in the Indian subcontinent and other British colonial or influenced regions. It ensured long-term, if not permanent, tension between Iraq and Iran. Does somebody have comments? No? Okay. As opposed to using the Thalweg principle. Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, so yes, it says that Google says that China was the first who started using gunpowder. They were the ones who created it though. They were using gunpowder for weapons? Mr. Anna, does it say that they were using it for weapons? Because I know they created it. Have to do some more Google search. Let me that. look again. It was first used in uh, 904 AD. Oh, wow, okay. So it was before the Ottoman Empire. Or, yeah. Yeah. And it says that it goes into Euro Asia in the 13th century. Okay, thank you. So this, um, they're looking to create permanent tension between Iraq and Iran. As opposed to using the Thalweg principle as advised during 1920 to 1932 period, which would have calmed down or ended the river border tensions between the two nations. The Shat al-Arab and the forest were depicted in the middle of the coat of arms of the Kingdom of Iraq. And you can see it here. Um, 
in here, uh, in the coat of arms of the Kingdom of Iraq, 1932 to 1959. So they were claiming it, they wanted it as their own, if I understood correctly. Under Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi in the late 60s, Iran developed a strong military and took a more assertive stance in the Near East. In April 1969, Iran abrogated the 1937 treaty over the Shat al Arab, and Iranian ships stopped paying tolls. And I was looking up that word abrogated too. Somebody else might already know it, but if I remember right, it just means to um, treat it like it doesn't exist. Maybe somebody has, that's roughly what I remember it being, if anybody has a better definition um, or a more accurate one, but that's what I remember looking at, but it's been a couple weeks. So they abrogated the 37 treaty over the Shat al-Arab and Iranian ships stopped paying tolls to Iraq when they used the Shat al-Arab. The Shah argued that the 1937 treaty was unfair to Iran because almost all river borders around the world ran around along the Thalweg and because most of the ships that used the Shat al-Arab were Iranian. Iraq threatened war over the Iranian move but on the 24th of April, 1969, an Iranian tanker escorted by Iranian warships um, sailed down the Shad al-Arab and Iraq being the military, militarily weaker state did nothing. The Iranian abrogation of the 1937 treaty marked the beginning of a period of acute Iraqi-Iranian tension that was to last until the Algiers Accord of 1975. So Iraq basically just pretended it didn't exist and started using it as they wanted to. Um, and uh, Iraq wasn't strong enough militarily to do anything about it, but this then creates tensions between them. So there's a dispute over this border that is part of their um, animosity towards one another. And this eventually leads you into Saddam because this Algiers Accord involves the Shah and um, Saddam Hussein. All United Nations attempts to intervene and mediate the dispute were rebuffed. Under Saddam Hussein, Ba'athist Iraq claimed the entire waterway up to the Iranian shore as its territory. In response, Iran in the early 70s became the main patron of Iraqi Kurdish groups fighting for independence from Iraq. In March 1975, Iraq signed the Algiers Accord in which it recognized a series of straight lines closely approximating the Thalweg, the deepest channel of the waterway, as the official border, in exchange for which Iran ended its support for the Iraqi Kurds. In 1980, Hussein released a statement claiming to abrogate, so he does the same thing, um, the 1975 treaty, and Iraq invaded Iran. International law, however, holds that in all cases, no bilateral or multilateral treaty can be abrogated by one party only. The main thrust of the military movement on the ground was across the waterway, which was the stage for most of the military battles between the two armies. The waterway was Iraq's only outlet to the Persian Gulf. I said Iran, but it's Iraq, sorry. The only outlet for Iraq to the Persian Gulf. Um, and thus, its shipping lanes were greatly affected by continuous Iranian attacks. When the al Faw Peninsula was captured by the Iranians in 1986, and that's right down in here, um, Iraq's shipping activities virtually came to a halt and had to be diverted to the Arab ports, to other Arab ports such as Kuwait and even Aqaba, Jordan, and the end of the Iran-Iraq war, both sides agreed to once again treat the Algiers Accord as binding. So historical origins of the conflict, got religious differences, um, Iraq leader Saddam Hussein, his Sunni Muslim, and the majority of the Iraqi people are Shias, um, whereas in Iran, the majority is Shia Muslim. The Shat al-Arab, the waterway dispute, um, it was an important channel for the oil exports of both countries. 1937, Iraq acquired control. Iran had to pay tolls in 1969. Iran abrogated the treaty, leading to acute tension. Um, the third was the Khuzestan oil-rich province, large Arab-speaking population. So what Iraq wanted was this area here, and they wanted control of um, this waterway. 
and then you have all the religious differences. So I'm kind of thinking we'll skip past this part. What, what time we have? Because we kind of went through a lot of this in a different way. It's just, um, I don't know, maybe we'll go through it. And if it's, uh, hopefully it's helpful. It's a lot of information, but it's a few pages left. Is everybody doing okay? Questions, comments, too much information at once? No, it's, it's good. Very interesting. Very okay. good. Okay. okay. Yeah, we're doing okay. Also. Okay. So this, huh? Somebody says questions about the gunpowder in the chat. If you want me to read those, what'd you say? There was more additions in the chat about the gunpowder. Oh, okay. Go ahead. So um, gunpowder was invented in ninth century China as one of the four great inventions and spread throughout most parts of Eurasia by the end of the 13th century. Originally developed by the Taoist for medical medicinal purposes, gunpowder was first used for warfare around 904 AD. And then the Taoist for medicinal purposes, gunpowder, okay, the same, um, abrogated, repel, or do away with, what, I'm not sure, abrogated. Okay, abrogated is to repel or do away with. Yeah. Okay, and that's, that's everybody. And it was just, uh, one party instead of both parties agreeing with doing away with. But I guess if you're militarily weaker and you can't do anything about it, then you have to live with it until you get stronger, I guess. So these are major events in the Iran-Iraq war. September 1980, Saddam Hussein, leader of Iraq, invaded Iran. He believed that, that um, the Ayatollah Khomeini wanted to overthrow him because he wanted all of Iraq to be Shiite and Saddam Hussein along with some of his colleagues were Sunni. Saddam Hussein knew that Khomeini inspired a lot of people with the Islamic revolution, so he saw him as a threat and thus he invaded Iran. Um, Saddam also wanted to be um, ruler of the Middle East. Saddam, uh, sorry, September 22nd, uh, 1980, the Iraqi military launched two attacks on Iran. On November 7th, Iranian commando units attacked Iraqi oil export terminals. Um, uh, I'm not sure where the um, where this one was, but I know that this was one that was right down on the bottom border. Um, and I think it said that most of their battles were there at, that wa at the waterway there. So January 18th, 1981, Saddam Hussein tells Iran that America has been giving Iraq arms. February 9th, 1981, both Iran and Iraq agreed to a visit by Islamic leaders looking to bring a peaceful end to the Iran-Iraq war. February 22nd, uh, Iranian leaders insist that there will be no ceasefire while Iraqi troops are on Iranian soil. March 27th, the Islamic peace movement tries again for a peaceful resolution. January 16, 1982, the Washington Report, Post reports that the Iranian military is turning the tide of the war and winning the battle against Iraq. April 30th, 1982, Iran launches a new offensive against Iraq aimed at finally driving the Iraqis out of Iranian territory. October 2nd, 1982, Iranian forces attack Iraqi units inside Iraq and claim to have recaptured 90 kilometers territory. September 20th, um, 1983, Ayatollah Khomeini threatens to cut off oil supplies to the West by closing the Persian Gulf if Western countries step up aid um, to Iraq. February 12th, 1984 marks the first time in the conflict that both sides are intentionally striking at civilian targets. May 20th and 21st of 84, a ship registered in Panama becomes the first commercial carrier sunk in the Persian Gulf after an Iraqi attack. Officials from the State Department blame Iran for the continuation of the war. June 15th, 1984, United Nations Secretary Brokers, Secretary Brokers an agreement between Iran and Iraq, which both sides agreed to halt attacks on civilian targets. November 26, 1984, the United States and Iraq reestablished full diplomatic relations. 
March 7, 1985, both Iran and Iraq abrogate the June 84 treaty that banned military attacks on civilians. February 24, 1986, the UN Security Council passes a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in the Iran-Iraq war. On July 8, Iran at again attempts to cross the border into Iraq. Iran claimed to kill 2,000 Iraqi soldiers. However, Iraq claims they were annihilated by the invading Iranian force. June 21, 1987, the UN Security Council agrees to a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. Hang on one second. Let me just throw this out in the other room. Okay. So um, March 11th, 1988, a truce signed in Ankara. Iran and Iraq agreed to halt attack on each other's cities. So this is what I was working on, but I need to eliminate, and I'm praying that you know, everybody's got the file. I send it out that we can kind of try to work on it together and, and much prayer as to really trying to put our heads into the study of parables. And I know that I struggle with this, feel so weak in this area, but in looking at it through the lens of the King of the South, the King of the North, the battles and the significant, the significant battles and the outcome, et cetera, all along these lines, so that we can take and compare and contrast them. So we're not gonna read through these because we've just basically done that. I just laid them out together. And, uh, that might be, oh, there's just one other thing that um, this, this was something else I wanted to put in, but I could never figure out where to put it in. So we'll just read it. And I think it's the last slide. The experience of Iran-Iraq um, war 1980 to 1988 has also encouraged Iran to focus its attention on securing the shipping routes in the Persian Gulf. During the so-called tanker war, Iranian and international tankers that carried petroleum to the energy markets were constantly attacked resulting in fuel rations and economic hardships in Iran. The conflict, in effect, forced the United States, Soviet Union, and other major powers to intervene to ensure the free flow of oil through the Strait of Hormez. Ever since the establishment of the Islamic Republic of 1979, U.S.-Iranian relations have been locked in a geopolitical competition over power and influence in the Persian Gulf, effectively creating a zero-sum atmosphere. While some in both Tehran and Washington insist that a conflict between the United States and Iran is inevitable, I believe a tolerable coexistence which guarantees the interests of both sides in the Persian Gulf is not out of reach. Iran and the United States are both interested in upholding the Persian Gulf's maritime security, combating extremist groups, and ensuring the free flow of oil and energy. These areas of mutual interest can be the groundwork for coexistence, Iran strongly believes that the Persian Gulf is its own backyard and it should be given freedom of action to play its natural role as the hegemon, the hegemon being the leader of the Middle East. While this is not currently acceptable to any U.S. administration, Iran's legitimate security concerns should not be dismissed. Iran, too, should recognize the U.S. commitment to protect its interests and those of its allies and refrain from actions that could antagonize the United States. So the link up there for that article is, is here in the top that you can grab and read the whole article. There were several articles that I pulled things from. Um, and uh, that's the end of that. Um, and then I don't know if, what time do we have? We still have a little bit of time then, right? Is that about 14 minutes? That's that. We'll put this out there and see who has input and we'll, I can kind of build it as we talk about it. If anybody has any, um, the, if we first get the line set up right, because I wasn't really sure that I had this right. And who can help with that? We know that, um, We have 1840 here, and we have 2020 here, where we're at. 
we know that this is going to be a win for the king of the north. Correct? We know that this is the decline of the United States. Um, I have a question. This thought occurred to me the, the, um, a couple of days ago. I think it applies because it's talking about the king of the north and the king of the south. Um, we've always understood in terms of the papacy that the papacy receives a deadly wound and the deadly wound is healed. From that, we under, came to understand by compare and contrast that if there's a deadly wound and a, de and a death for the king of the north, then there was a deadly wound and a death for the king of the south, right? So we know that 1989 was a de deadly wound for the king of the south and then a death at 1991. We know that the deadly wound for the king of the south is um, 2021 and its death is here. So I've not heard anybody ever say this, but wouldn't there be also, is there also a, in terms of the United States, a deadly wound and then a death? I thought that's what it was when it switches from kingdom to kingdom. So like six to seven. Because remember on the line how we have that declining thing of US, but also the rising of the seventh kingdom. So like yeah. six going down and seven going up. Would that work? I don't know. I don't know. I was well, no, I don't think so because that yeah, well, I don't know. Because we, I don't know that we still fully understand the role of the papacy going forward. Yeah, and also, I know Russia is, because at 2021, they get their deadly wound and they die at Sunday law, but I've seen Elder Tess put on the line, the U.S. Sixth Kingdom is declining while the Seventh is, but we maybe we just don't have enough light on that yet, I'm not sure. Did that make sense, what I was saying? I was thinking I was way off, but if you understood what I was saying, then... <laughs> <laughs> no, because it. I always wondered that too, honestly, because you have the king of the north and the king of the south. That's why you know the king of the south does what it does, because the king of the north. Well, the, the, king of the, the, north, the king of the north continues. And you have, don't you have in this period of time, it, this is the way I understand it, but I don't know if it's right. I kind of just wait and, and as we study things out and see, you know, but what I've thought it was is that the king of the north, the true king of the north and the false king of the north go head to head here. And I don't know if that's the way to say that. We know that this is the period of the seventh kingdom. And and so if that would be the case, then I'm just throwing this out there to think about because I don't know if it's right or wrong, that the king of the north receives a deadly wound somewhere in here and then a, and then a death. But that may be way off. It would have to be after the King of the South's death, deadly wound and death, wouldn't it? Yeah, I must have said something really bad. Sorry. <laughs> but I'm just thinking it's maybe no no no. Maybe it's no, I, it the north, for the King of the North, maybe it's at close of probation. The death? Yeah, the deadly wound at closer probation and then the death because the whole earth is pretty much destroyed and the king of the north, final, the false one, finally is destroyed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the true one will reign. So I don't know. Well, um, and help me fill in anything we can fill in here, but we know that this is a um, king of the north win. Um, and I don't know how quickly I can, okay, so we have a King of the North win here, and we know that we have a King of the North win here, and I don't have 2019 on here, but I'm just trying to break down these 10-year wars, and like I said, we need to all be, look. we need to also be looking at, um, um, 1979 to 1989. Uh, I, I 
think you would put it, call it as she calls it, bookends. I'm not sure, but you have the 10 year period here and then you have the 10 year period. Um, let me copy this one over here. And you have this 10 year period here. And I don't know that that belongs just yet. It's just a place marker to save me from thinking. Okay, so, so you have this 10 year period here, the same as you have this 10 year period here. And this is a proxy war. And we were talking about this on Wednesday night, that this is a proxy war too. Um, the Soviet Afghan war, but you also have the Iran Iraq war, but the so in the Soviet Afghan war, you have um, different ideologies here than you have in this war. In this war, the ideologies we talked about, does anybody remember on Wednesday night? I guess that's a no. Um, the king of the north is uh, capitalism. And the king of the south, communism. And then for the ideology over here, you have, um, and I don't know if I'm going to say this right. What's the right word to use when you want to spread democracy? Democra I was saying democratization. Is that, how, is that the right word? Yeah, I think so. Spell it. Is that good? And this, um, this is what um, Brother Itabo was sharing, which I, I, I used a different word when I was doing some of the notes that I was reading, but he used Islama. I used Islamification, Islamization, I think is what he said. If I, if I spelled that correctly. Um, because in this battle here, this would take us back into the period of Obama and, and when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State and they killed Gaddafi. Let me shut the door here. And they killed Gaddafi and if everybody remembers when Putin saw that video and watched it and said, never again, never, never again. And so what Putin does in this, is, in this battle here is he upholds the, the dictators and allowing them to, to have their way. And if people want to be um, um, Islamic rule, let them so be it. Don't come in there and change their government. And, and I think that some other things that we need to look at, they're only things that have come to my mind, but there's so many tentacles to this. And maybe if somebody wants to look into it is, um, and there's probably, I think there's more than one, but Chech Chechnya, is that how you say that word? Che the Chechnyan war? Yeah. And, and Adriana, you and your mom probably understand this better, but I, I didn't, I really totally naive when it comes to history and, and all this stuff and I'm learning along the way. But how Islam um, is in, in what they do in Russia. So there's Islamic people in Russia that are part of this scenario too. Um, I don't know anything about the Chechen war, but there are a lot of Muslims in Russia. Not in the Chechen war, do I have the wrong one? Maybe no, I'm just saying that I don't know about that. Oh, okay, okay. It might be a different one that I'm thinking of. I just haven't gone back and looked at it. Um, because I know there's issues that have taken place in Russia when it comes to um, the threat of Islam. I just haven't looked into it enough. So I just thought it was interesting that, that they um, don't like the, what Islam brings, but yet, but I could under, I mean, I guess I could understand you go into the Middle East, that's where you live and then let them be. So that seems to be the, the king of the South way in the this the current Syrian war is to um, support the dictators and um, support is Islamization, if that's the right way to say that word. 
So we'll get a few pieces put together and um, together and I'll email this out and maybe we can build on it and um, through the histories that we're studying, um, work on it together or what have you. Anybody, any thoughts or comments? Yeah, I have a quick one. Um, so when, like Cass, when she comes up with what way marks are important, like which ones to cut away and which ones are the ones to focus on, it's usually yeah. based off of other way marks or lines that we already have and the events that happen there. So do you start with the history and then start with Yeah, so for like 1979, 89, 2011, do you mean 2001? This is the beginning of the war is what I put that as. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, 2011 to 2021, all of these. There's other things happening at this time too, right? On our lines. Yeah. Yeah, what I started to do, but I didn't finish that part, um, is in the World War III notes to pull that line of um, of uh, our history, the World yeah. War III line, in underneath all of this. So maybe yeah. I'll add that in. I did it, I had it on one of the notes, I don't remember, I think it was in the Saddam notes that we looked at, and I'll pull it in and put it under this when I email it out, so that we can see um, the history here with the rise of Saddam Hussein, we see the rise of Mujahideen, we see the rise of uh, Al-Qaeda, and the, the lines as pertains to World War III. So that's probably the line to take with. And I started to do that. I just didn't do it on this part. Because I wanted this to kind of focus as well on these 10-year um, periods as well. And then you have the 10-year period here. So I'll fold that in. That's Thank you. Anybody it else? It helps is all. Because it, it, otherwise, it's like, where do you start? Because Tess... Uh, what, what was it she did? It's based off of the Pyrus lines and the big events that happened there. Then she was able to match it to, to World War II. And she was like, ah, oh, the same things happen here. And that's how you know it helps a lot, I think. I think it'll help. Okay. I'll add that line down here at the bottom. And then um, prayerfully, uh, between us all, we can start piecing some things together. and see where God leads. Anybody else? And we know we up here, we have the French Revolution, right? Anyways, do I have this right? Adriana, do you know? I thought that's what it was on the big line. Was 1850? Okay. What was the close of probation date? 1861. That's what I thought. Okay. According to the lab. That was what Tabo was putting on the line over there on his Thursday meetings. That's what I thought I remembered seeing. Yeah, I think Tess talked about that too. Anything else anybody can see that we can put in here for before I before we close out and then I'll email it out as finished as we or as progressed as we get. No. Well then if that's it then we can um, close in prayer if somebody wants to to pray. Sister Adriana, how's your voice doing? You want to pray? It's all right. I think I can get through it. Hold on. Let me just drink some water real quick. Okay. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this wonderful studies we were able to have the Sabbath. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we got to study with Elder Parmender and his presentation and, and how the keys to our relationships among us are being unlocked and being set right and how you're bringing clarity into our understanding of our interactions with one another, Lord. We thank you so much for that blessing. We also thank you for the blessing of all this history we've been able to learn over the past, I don't know how many Sabbaths, it's been quite a few now, and now we finally get to be able to start putting it together on lines. We thank you for bringing us this far. We ask that you guide our minds and our understanding to be able to figure out what important events happened when and, and what to put on what way mark. Help us to understand and to see clearly, Lord. 
and help us to be able to come together and make clear lines and, and uh, see the parables and the hidden treasure that you have for us. We thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you for everyone who's able to join us today and for the studies we're able to have together. We ask that you continue to be with us for the rest of the Sabbath and for the upcoming week. Help us, Lord, to continue on on these studies and to put more time into it and in any spare moment that we have, Lord, to draw closer to you and use it wisely. We thank you so much for all the love that's growing in our heart for the people around us, all the understanding that we're gaining, all the compassion that that's growing in our hearts, Lord, and understanding how many people struggle on this world that we never realized before, how many things we hadn't considered and how complicated things can be. Lord, nothing is so straightforward that we can just look at someone and judge them and think that we know what we're doing. We thank you for opening our eyes to this. And we thank you, Lord, for helping us to have that sympathy and compassion that we need to, to have the true Christian character. We thank you and we pray all these things in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I did have one quick thought. Because 2014 is way mark, right? 2014 and 2019. Um, I don't remember if that was on, I'll close that other file down. Um, if anybody remembers that this was a two year period here, and then this was a two year period here, broke up in the middle by 1840, and this is 18, um, this is a, a 2020. So there was a six year period in, in between. Um, and I don't know that it's exact, but we have 2014, which is our way mark, and 2019, which is a way mark. And 2014 is when the caliphate was. Um, um, when they declared a caliphate in 2019, the caliphate is declared broken up. So those should probably be on there as well. What does everybody think before I shut this down? Anybody? Yes, I think so. You, I think you had it on one yes. of your little uh, graphs earlier. On the one of the other ones, probably. Yeah. That two, I remember that six year and the two two years. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that's the one I had open. I don't think I pulled it up today, but yeah. So we'll put that there. And we'll put 2019 here. And that was the the demise of the caliphate. After I just made those smaller, I need to... Okay. And what would we actually say? Caliphate, how do we word that? Broke? Broken? I don't know what word to use. This is declared. I don't know if I use the right word. Anybody comments or a better word to choose than broke? Defeated? Invalidated? Invalidated? I think it's better than broke. <laughs> OK. Okay, I noticed you guys had comments in the chat, but uh, um, when I was in there, but resolved, okay. Yeah, she had broken too, okay. Oh no, I guess not. I thought you had some comments in here that would help me. <laughs> um, but anyways, that's all I have. And, and I'm gonna save that file separate and I'll send it out. For those that have PowerPoint, you can play around with it yourself. I'll send it out in PowerPoint and PDF either way. Um, and then we can bring it together and start building on it uh, as we go forward. And then, like I said, those that can work in PowerPoint can do it right there in PowerPoint. If they need to print it out and write things down, they can do that however, however you do it. And then we'll work on putting it together and just building it. Well, thank you. For everybody's yes, Sister Elaine, Jackie. Hi. Um, 
Yes. What was the, and thank you very much. Uh, this is um, really growing, but we each have to do our part as well. I've got all kinds of notes with lines and here and there. And yeah, I need to get more organized, but it, it, yeah, there's a lot of material. But what I wanted to ask you is about Parmenders, Elder Parmenders study this morning. And was that going to be posted uh, early this week? The, they, about where, where it can be found. Which one was it? And I'll email yeah. the link. where does that come from? I'll email out the link. Okay. Uh, I think Sister Christine, I think I, it was her that I asked, and she posted it in the chat a while back. And I'll email out the link as well, where the first two, well, there was one that wasn't recorded. And then the last two weeks were recorded. And then today um, uh, will be, is I'm sure, I, yeah, they did say they were recording it. I did record the audio for it. Um, if anybody wants just the audio, because you really didn't do a whole lot of board work. And I did record the audio on it. I'm going to be sending that out anyways. And um, so, okay. so going forward, he, um, based on what he said, we'll be doing this again next week. And there's, there it is, Sister Jackie. She just posted it again. So based on... Okay, yeah. I thought I saw that back. Yeah, and I have my notes that go to my file on uh, Dropbox. So I'll I, I'll I can look at that as well. Yeah, I'll email it so you'll have it in the, um, for email. To just save the email later. Um, so from what I understand, he's going to do this again next week. So um, was everybody okay with the way we ran the schedule today? Would you change anything? No, that was great. I, I thought it was a perfect day. Beautiful. Okay. I, I, we also, I think several, good. several of us saw um, that it was going on last week, but it was too late to do anything about it. And I emailed... Um, a couple of different people about trying to get confirmation and I happened to get up and during like about 3 30 in the morning to I think I got up to go to the bathroom or something decided to open all the windows to try to see if I can fend off the 108 degree <laughs> weather in the house um, get some cool get it cooled down some and then I wound up looking at my phone real quick and then that's when I saw and I never did go back to sleep because that's when I saw that um, it was a confirmation that he was presenting and it was at 5.30 their time and I had already checked it out and it was 9.30 our time and what my plan was is if I got it confirmed early enough I'd just send out the email saying this is what we're going to do and everybody would know we would have had the link and all that so um, so we'll do it this way then next week as well we'll start off with our Sabbath school at 8.30 and um, break away for his presentation and then go from depending on how long he goes through because <laughs> he went for quite a while today. So, and then we'll do something, do um, our stuff in the afternoon. Everybody okay with that? We like it. Sounds We're good. Okay. 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 I was blessed to be able, I mean, when we get to jo join um, Elder Parminder or Elder Tess and everyone else around the world, is a, it's a great blessing. So. Okay. Well, God bless everybody. So see you Wednesday night. Will there be in another session? Oh, not today, sister. Um, I think that's Marioni. Not today. We're actually closing up for the day. Um, Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Enjoy. It's 100 and 108 here today, this afternoon. Oh, wow. You too. Very, very hot. It's, one, it's 109 over here. <laughs> well, we're right behind you. <laughs> yeah. And I don't have air conditioning. <laughs> no. Oh, boy. Oh, no. Yeah, up in Oregon, you need it in Southern Oregon towards September or August, September. But I've got high ceilings and fans and so... <laughs> That's and I've got my windows closed, my shades closed. <laughs> so yeah. it keeps it cooler. Something else that really helps is just get like a, a wet like a wet washcloth or even a paper towel, cold water, and wipe yourself down um, 
you know, a couple of times here and there. And then when you have the fans on, it really is a lot easier to get through it. Yeah, sounds good. Or you know what you could do sometimes? My husband does this um, at night, open the windows to cool the house down, you know, like the evening. And then early in the morning, close it up to capture all the cool and just leave, you know, all the windows, blinds and stuff down. That's if it's cool at night. We went to 78 at night, yeah, it doesn't work. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I did that this morning, so yeah. It does the heat's help. outside, yeah. it's not too bad in here no, right now, yeah. but it's hot uh, out there. Yeah. Come on, go you guys are in Arizona? No, we're in um, California. We're in Southern Cal. Oh, in Southern California. I don't know where. where... Yeah, with lots of fires but, going on, too. Jackie, where are you? I'm in Medford, Oregon. Oh. oh well, oh. outside of Medford, Eagle Point. Yeah, it's a little suburb. Oh, I didn't know, I didn't know it got that hot up there. I, I didn't know it got it. that hot. Oh, my. Oh, it's, it's going to be this way tomorrow. But probably, uh, well, their look, the outlook is about four or five days here. So Northern California is going the same way, Redding and all down there. It's, it's still, you know, they get the very high heat too. Well, We're just, I'm just, I'm just be playing, really. We're supposed to have thunderstorms. And well, that's just, where the danger lies now. We just had a, a big fire over here that went on for, gosh, I don't know, like a week. Fire. Yeah, it was just east of Victor and his family's yeah. home. And he took, I took a picture from mine 20 miles away, and he took a picture from his about six miles away. I'm like, oops. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, these fires. Yeah, you get, I saw you get that. A fire at this time, news. When the fire comes out on this hot, I mean, it's just so hard to put it out. Now we have one up, yeah, up by Santa Clarita, Lake Hughes fire. It's out of control up there. Oh, but that's 100 miles. Yeah. Yeah. Well. It's certainly time to, to pray for all of these things going on in our weather system as well as other things. So yeah. I'll keep in my prayers oh, we wherever will. we are. We will I'm too. going to exit out. I don't know if that leaves you guys all there or not if you wanted to continue on, but I'm going to exit out myself so that the okay. video can start um, converting. Thanks. Okay. Well, ha happy Sabbath, everybody. Have a wonderful yeah. Sabbath day. See everybody on Wednesday. For those that don't, God bless you. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you. God bless. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.